I'm Luca Giliberti, contributing writer for Gold Derby, and I'm joined today by Emmy-winning editor Stephanie Filo, who received a whopping three Emmy nominations this year, uh, including one for Netflix's Dahmer Monster, The Jeffrey Dahmer Story. And you know, Stephanie, let's start right there. Um, what was it like uh, finding out that you got three nominations? Walk me through nominations in the morning. Um, well, you know, I was kind of just getting ready for the day because they announced it really early in the morning. Um, I didn't realize it was the, the day of, but I got a text from Robin Thede, who's our showrunner on a Black Lady sketch show to our group that was just like, congratulations, guys. And then a few seconds later, she's like, oh, holy cow, Stephanie, congrats on like two nominations in the same <laughs> category. And then like two minutes later, she's like, oh my God, three, congrats on the three. So I found out through her, um, texting me at like eight in the morning like that I had gotten these three and I just didn't believe it and um I had to go like reread it multiple times <laughs> myself because I was just like this is not not the Wednesday I, morning I had planned <laughs> at all um and so it it um I think it just took me by surprise because then she called me mm -hmm. and I was literally speechless I didn't know what to what to say um it was extra special though because my dad is actually in town at the moment so we were kind of oh, like nice. sitting on the couch getting ready for the day so it was a really like special moment to be excuse me to be able to say to him to, uh that oh hey I've been nominated for three Emmys this morning <laughs> um uh so it was a very very surreal experience but just very like I'm just so like humbled and grateful and mm -hmm. I still still just cannot believe it yeah, it's not often that uh, someone gets three nominations in one year. And I like that you said that you sort of had to make the double check that you actually got the three because you always have to go through those very long documents to find uh, the categories. So uh, that must have been uh, must have been fun as well. Um, <laughs> yeah, just trying to find the editing categories and hundreds yeah. of, of others. Take yeah. A moment. <laughs> Yeah, and we'll talk mainly about uh, Dahmer here. Um, and the episode that you're nominated for is, is the fourth episode, uh, The Good Boy Box, uh, which is one of two that you edited. And you know what is um, special about the show and obviously about this episode as well is that the show follows this nonlinear story structure. So by the time we get to your episode, um, many of the timelines that are in it have already been introduced. So you basically have to come in and, and pick up where we last left off in these timelines. So what was that preparation like to, to ensure that you could build the bridge between what we had already seen in the previous three episodes and what we see in your episode uh, episode in these different timelines then? Um, it was a process as we were editing it because um, a lot of the way it was written was not necessarily with with the same time jumps in the same places. So it was kind of a matter of figuring out like, and like, I know that, for example, there's a scene where he's on the roof and he's throwing ashes mm -hmm. um, at the end of episode three. And you kind mm -hmm. of see episode four coming back into that and then coming yeah. into the crime scene, you know, nine, 10 years later. Um, so it was kind of just a matter of like knowing all of the material. We kind of all knew each other's episodes um, daily is what they looked like. Um, okay. And also figuring out where different things would pay off. Um, in episode four, the one that's that's nominated, there's a long sequence where um, Jeffrey basically gets sent to college. He fails out of college. Then he is in the army. He arrives home for like this Christmas dinner uh, with his parents. Mm -hmm. And then um, in the middle of this Christmas dinner, you're also seeing his time in the army. Um, yeah. And that didn't, always, that didn't always used to be like that. There was kind okay. of moments where you had this full Christmas dinner sequence that was just like the awkward time with his parents and you had the um and you had his time in the army separately um so it was kind of wow. a matter of like yeah it was figuring out kind of in the edit is there a way to maybe punch up what's being said to really highlight mm -hmm. highlight the gravity of certain things you know I think it's it's one thing to see him kind of in the army learning about halcyon and like stealing these pills and you're just like oh that's a really messed up sequence of events but when you see the way he kind of rationalize it with rationalizes it with his parents um mm -hmm. he's like yeah you know i'm a set medic and then you cut into him in the army and he's just excited about learning about how to drug people it's not like he's actually you know doing <clears throat> doing <laughs> doing this to be a good a good set medic so um yeah. Yeah, it was really a matter of like figuring out ways to punch it up and also figuring out ways that even though some of these these uh, storylines 
kind of pay off in episode four. They still kind of come back in right, the later. Yeah. Episode. Totally. Um, also, his, you know, his dad, Lionel, you know, you kind of see a bunch of him in this episode, but it kind of pays off in episode eight later. Yeah. You know, yeah. as you exactly. as you kind of, you know, you see this progression of this character and, you know, all of the things that happen in episode four, he kind of ignores and just, you know, he's just kind of mad at his son or annoyed at his son. But in episode eight, he kind of sees the gravity of his mistakes as well. You know, what it, what it's like for him to be ignoring, ignoring these very real warning signs. <clears throat> yeah, absolutely. I love that you mentioned that because I actually want to talk about um, the Lionel we see in episode four and the Lionel we see in episode eight in, in just a second. But I would like to go back to what you were talking about with the, you know, military and sort of this long sequence in which we see such an important stretch of his life and we sort of jump from one moment to the next. Um, so mm -hmm. was there sort of a through line or some kind of arc that you came up with in your head that helped you sort of transition, uh, you know, from one timeline um, to the next? Because I sort of sensed one throughout the episode while I was watching it, but I'd be curious to hear from you whether there was anything that you sort of came up with in your head that sort of helped you really jump from one to the next um, and have the transitions be smooth. Yeah, I think for me, when, when I approached this series in general, my biggest concern was that Jeffrey would come across as a sympathetic character. And that's the one thing, you know, when I took this project on as well, I was like, no matter what, I know I need to fight to make sure that, you know, I'm happy with the way that we're portraying what happened. Mm -hmm. You know, that was the bottom line for me. And so I think, you know, when you look at him, if you think about that scene when he comes home from the military and he's just sitting with his family, yeah, it just, it just looks like a dysfunctional family. And in a way, you're kind of like, oh, like poor Jeff, um, you know, it's too bad that he has these kind of like weird, <laughs> this weird you know, uh, f like family structure that's mm -hmm. that's kind of broken versus if you kind of see that, see the weird family structure, but then you kind of pop out to see, oh, this is like actually, this is actually where his headspace is. Yeah. You know, it kind of, I, I just wanted to make sure that it was portrayed in like a real, a real way. Um, and you'll see a lot of times in the show, we kind of you know, when we first started cutting it, we cut it kind of in this traditional way where it's, you mm -hmm. know, you say something, you cut to the other person, there's like yeah. music, music where you would expect like, oh, this is, you know, this is the sad moment. So you would hear music. So I think we really consciously made an effort also to like dial back in a way. Mm -hmm. So a lot of, a lot of the shots that you'll see are like one long wide shot of yeah, people. Exactly. Popping with no music at all. And that was really so that people could objectively take what they what they wanted to out of the footage. You know, they could see the scene play out for the, you know, the way that it actually played out, you know, theoretically mm -hmm. played out and kind of see the gravity of the situation. And it's kind of leaves you with like a visceral feeling watching it and also and also editing it. But I think it it was important to be sure to to highlight kind of the story the way that it happened as opposed to tr kind of like right. telegraphing for the audience what they should be feeling you know mm -hmm. it's it's pretty apparent I think when you look at look at some gruesome like a gruesome wide shot of something like you know you don't need music to tell you <laughs> to tell Absolutely. you that gruesome, you know yeah <laughs> of course and I think what you what you're bringing up is sort of an important point which is perspective um, which is obviously so important uh, on this show because, you know, there are a lot of episodes that are told um, mainly or almost exclusively from the point of view of um, his victims uh, and their families. But uh, an episode like this one, there it is sort of more Jeffrey POV heavy. And you sort of talked about how you never want, how, yes, we're sort of in his world and in his head, but we never, you, I guess everyone who worked on the show, the intention was never to um, have viewers sympathize with him. And I feel like one of those scenes in which that could have happened but didn't is the diner scene between Jeffrey Lionel and Sherry, um, in which Jeffrey, you know, tries to mention all these fantasies that he's had, but then Lionel sort of cuts him off and deliberately deflects. So talk about the process of putting together that scene and, and capturing all the nuances that are coming from um, that Evan Peters, uh, Richard Jenkins and Molly Ringwald uh, are giving you with their performances. Yeah, that scene was very difficult actually to put together because of that. Because, um, 
Because I think, you know, on paper, if you just look at it, you're like, oh, poor, you know, poor Jeff. This is like a kid that's just trying to to talk to his parents and they won't mm-hmm. listen. But the reality is like, it's also kind of a weird scenario because this is the first time he's meeting his stepmom ever. You know, sure, they came, yeah. they, they, you know, came home to find him drunk for like, he's been at home for three months just drinking. Um. And so it's like, you know, they go to the diner, they have this kind of interaction, but it's like, it's awkward because him talking to, you know, Molly Ringwald's character, Sherry, um, Mm -hmm. this is his first kind of interaction with her and she's trying to kind of step in and say say like, oh, we support you, like just throwing that stuff in there, not her also not understanding maybe the full, the full scope of things. But, um, you know, I think it's, it, it could have been really easy to play that as just like a, you know, this is again, like the Christmas scene, you know, exactly. this is Jeff and his, and his kind of messed up family. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, and so I really tried to find kind of the more haunting takes, I think of Evan Peters. Um, because I think, you know, it's such a sinister thing that he's actually trying to confess. This isn't just like some simple, you know, teenage confession. Um you know, and he has these really, you know, gruesome fantasies. And so Mm -hmm. it's, you know, I think I, I tried to dial in on, you know, the more kind of menacing and, and, you know, creepy takes that Evan Peters has, because he, you know, this is something about Evan Peters, he gives you every possible variation, (laughs) which is incredible. Yeah. Yeah. Um, And so I just felt like, you know, I really needed to hone in on like the, the, sort of creepy sinister factor of what he's saying um and then also on the flip side the parents you know are so kind of chipper and like oh yeah why don't you go to college why don't you do this um so so I tried to find kind of the peppier versions of of you know Lionel and and his wife and like the creepier ones of Evan to have that sort of flow um and then musically you know I was hesitant to put anything I just kind of I think I just used like ambient like diner music in the background yeah. you kind of hear um and then towards the end it kind of veers a little bit into score but then cuts yeah. out kind of abruptly when when Lionel's like oh like why don't we just send you to Ohio State um so I think I you know in in doing it I just really tried to hone in on like the opposite of what was ha- you know mm-hmm. you know um, his parents were seeing a very different thing than he was you know so it was kind of like just trying to to focus on both sides of the perspective there. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's really interesting. And what I also really liked about the scene is that I think you sort of mentioned earlier that there are sort of stretches where you're, you know, just observing people. And I think we do stay on his face here because yes, we're in his world, but we don't stay on it for the entire time. Um, mm-hmm. You know, sometimes we cut to Lionel and to Sherry. Sometimes we, there, you sort of cut to a wider shot uh, of the diner. So was that also an intention to ensure that, again, we were not sort of stuck in his world and only focusing on him? Definitely, yeah. There was actually one version where I had like just the full scene play out in, in the wide, but it felt like it was such a, ah. it was such an important moment, I think, that and this episode is kind of unique in that it's the the first and kind of only time where like at different times within Jeff's perspective in the series. Exactly. Yeah. Um, exactly. And so I was trying to, I guess, like find whatever that balance was because I knew mm-hmm. this episode was a little different than the others. Um, uh, so I think, you know, consciously it was just kind of an effort, A, to get like the creepier version of, of Jeff to mm-hmm. play that up and B, to kind of show you know you needed to learn the dynamic of him and his new stepmom his dad yeah. uh, just what that looks like as well before we get into the other like meteor scenes later in the episode yeah and speaking of meteor scenes uh, or actually more gruesome scenes um obviously we also get a victim in this episode uh, Stephen Tuomi and um we sort of see Jeffrey black out uh, and then he wakes up to find the body. And then what's interesting is that the camera very slowly reveals the body. So, you know, what was important to you and everyone else who worked on this episode in terms of how this scene presented itself? Because again, we don't actually see, you know, what happens. We don't see the murder, um, but we're dealing with the aftermath. Um, so what was important in terms of the framing for, for everyone uh, who worked on the episode? 
Yeah, so cutting cutting this sequence, actually the sequence right before when Jeffrey accidentally drugs himself, mm-hmm. I think it's like the the kind of first and only time we're fully like in his perspective in this yeah. series, you know, because he, um, you know, obviously he is trying to drug Stephen and accidentally drugs himself. And so a big part of that was the sort of like juxtaposition where you're in that that sequence into this really kind of quiet, slow moving sequence where you reveal what happened. Mm -hmm. Um, And so building that section, a lot of it had to do with sound design and like trying to figure out what, I mean, I guess, you know, what his perspective would have been as a drugged person. Um, Right. You know, my my assistant editor, um, Lyric Ramsey, and I spent long, long hours just trying to figure out what the sound should feel like, because it's like we're like, okay, if he was drugged, things would start to get warped, like his vision would start to get warped. Um, And so, you know, you had uh, my assistant editor in the bathroom crushing up vitamins as like fully, you know, just to try to to try to build out that soundscape. and really feel like you're immersed in it before you like have this hard cut out into the the reveal of what actually happened um we there's a a song playing underneath on the radio Mm -hmm. that kind of slows down and then comes back to regular speed and slows down during that sequence he's talking and then you hear like this kind of uh reverb on his voice at times and like sometimes steven's voice is slowed down and comes back to regular um so we really were just trying to kind of play up what that perspective would have been because it is mm. like the only time we're fully in his perspective. And right. also to show just the gruesomeness of it, you know, the fact that he could like he could black out like that. And then suddenly the next morning, here you are with this really long shot of of the, you know, brutality that happened the night before. Um you know, and this was his first murder after nine years, you know, this exactly. was kind of his his trajectory kind of into becoming a serial killer in the first place. And so mm-hmm. we just felt like it was an important moment to, to highlight the kind of transition of that. We see it building all episode and then suddenly, boom, you're in this yeah. horrific, horrific um, scene. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, speaking of horrific, just one question about this episode before I ask one about the eighth. But then we get that uh, that final scene or that final shot in which uh, Jeffrey kisses, um, the, you know, in plastic wrapped severed head and then puts it in the box. You know, were there any discussions about ending the episodes a few shots earlier or why was it important for that to show that kiss, to show it as long as it's shown um, and to even include that scene at all? Because I'm sure there's a version where it was not in the episode. So talk about uh, that scene. Yeah, so that... That was a very that those dailies were very gruesome to look at. There were many, many there were many, many angles of that. Um but I, you know, I think again, just tying back to what we were talking about earlier, it felt important to like live in that moment because that was a mm-hmm. huge moment in his turning point. You know, that was yeah. that was, you know, this is where it's like this is the point of no return. He's mm-hmm. clearly, you know, he's clearly. <clears throat> the Jeffrey Dahmer that that we all know at this oh. point so um I wanted to hold on it for a long stretch I wanted to also emphasize like the box element because he basically picks it up kisses yeah. it and puts it in the box so there was you know at one point I tried a version where he just kisses the <laughs> kisses Stephen and then it cuts to black um there's another version from the front of him another shot from the front of him Mm -hmm. where he does it and puts it in the box so I tried that but I think ultimately I kind of landed again on you know we're holding long on these takes so you can you can the viewer can take what they want out of this um scenario and so it kind of just landed there yeah it's really a, a a haunting uh final a haunting final image and while I was watching it like I said I was like oh it's it's interesting that this was included but it adds so much to the episode and feels like uh it, the episode couldn't end in end any other way so um yeah and like i said i do briefly before we have to wrap things up want to uh, mention the other episode you edited which is lionel um which obviously includes the courtroom scenes which i read was sort of the part of the story that haunted you um the most and obviously yeah. those scenes are tricky because the focus is on the victims and, and is on the families but there are a few moments in which the camera cuts to 
Lionel or perhaps to Jeffrey or to other people in the courtroom. So what was the process of figuring out, you know, when the right moment was to cut to a reaction shot? Um, so, yeah, this footage, the original real life footage is something like that's what I remember when I think of this this mm -hmm. case. You know, I think it's been such a sensationalized story. But the thing to me that haunts me since the 90s, since this happened, is you know, the victim impact statements in the courtroom. And so when I, you know, got this episode in particular, I was like, I can't, I can't mess this up. Like I, you know, this, it's such an important um, thing for the the victim's families to be able to have their moment. Cause there's, yeah. you know, there's several of them who speak. And I think a lot of different times, like in the script, it's like a certain person was either lifted or, um, stuff like that. So I, you know, I really pushed to make sure that they could all be seen and have their moment there. And, um, you know, I know, knowing the gravity of this scene also, I waited for several days before I started cutting it. So I had the footage, yeah. I looked at the footage that they shot. Um, I wasn't really in the headspace yet to cut it. And I had to really build myself into that headspace because it is so like, so haunting to look at. Um, so I would get in, you know, get in in the morning, look at that day's dailies and cut different scenes, knowing mm -hmm. I had to eventually come back to this. Um, and I would look at the original footage from the courtroom and just kind of compare and contrast, um, mm -hmm. try to see how I could do people justice. So right. um, by the time I finally got to cutting that sequence, you know, I really just focused on which performances felt the closest to the real people mm -hmm. um, in the courtroom. I also, you know, I didn't want to cut to Jeff too much. I think I only cut to him maybe once in that yeah, sequence. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Because um, uh, I did feel like you have to at least see him once. But Absolutely. I was like, I, I was like, this is not his moment. So, mm -hmm. you know, and then I think we cut to Lionel, his dad, like in between one. Yeah, exactly. You know, from one victim to the neck or victim's family member to the next. Um, but we, I don't think we really show him much until finally Jeff is giving his final statement um, exactly. to the court. And that's when we kind of punch back into Lionel and you see like, he's finally understanding like the gravity of what has happened, ways that he's maybe failed over the years. And, you know, I think Richard Jenkins is such a phenomenal actor as well. That it's, you know, he, um, yeah, he was also haunting in that sequence. Yeah, absolutely. And even even that one moment in which Lionel is shown sort of in between, it, it's not even sort of a close up or anything. You sort of see him from further away and it doesn't really linger on that shot for very long, but it, it adds so much to the scene, um, even though the focus is obviously on the victims uh, and their families, um, rather their families. So uh, yeah, it's such an incredible sequence. Um, but I feel, and, uh, and ultimately, I mean, he he and his wife are also victims in a way, even absolutely. though, like, you know, even though, yes, they've failed in a lot of ways, mm -hmm. you know, they're also they're also part of part of all of this. So, yeah, yeah. absolutely. And the show uh, obviously explores that. And that's such an important part um, of the story. Um, and I would love to talk about it more, but I fear we're out of time. Oh. But uh, thank you so, so much, uh, Stephanie, for, for your insight today. And again, congratulations on your three nominations. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me. Mm -hmm.